Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this virtual presentation. Uh, my name is Annie Harris, and I'm with the Essex National Heritage Area. And national heritage areas are large lived-in landscapes that exemplify important aspects of American history, and their purpose is to conserve, interpret, and promote America's stories and the natural, historic, and cultural resources associated with these stories. So this region where we're sitting tonight, or where I'm sitting tonight, is Essex County, and it was designated a National Heritage Area by an Act of Congress in 1996. And there are 55 of these areas around the country. So at Essex Heritage, uh, we accomplish our work in partnership with many other organizations and people, some of whom are here tonight. And we thank everybody who made this evening possible, and especially our speakers, and also most especially Kate Fox, who has been the driving force behind Ancestry Days and making sure it happened despite the pandemic. So today is Friday, April 30th, 2021. And again, I'm very happy to welcome everyone to the special kickoff program for the first ever Salem Ancestry Days. Given the great public response we've gotten, I think we've had almost, uh, we've had well over 200 people have registered for this Zoom presentation. I anticipate that Ancestry Days is going to be a very successful event uh, now and this weekend and certainly into the future too. But first, I have a few important housekeeping notes before we begin. There are live captions available for this program uh, if you would like to see them. And at the menu bar at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to select closed caption and then show subtitle to start this feature. Feature. Uh, if you have any problem, I'm, use the chat room and our staff is monitoring it. Uh, following the presentation, there will be questions and answers with the presenters. I ask you to please submit your questions by typing them into the chat box. Uh, to do this, um, you can do this at any point during the talk. You can type in your questions, we're monitoring them, and we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible before the end of the program. Uh, finally, this presentation uh, is going to be recorded and will be made available on the Essex Heritage YouTube channel. So we will provide a link to this recording to all attendees as soon as we get it uploaded. So now for the program. First, I would like to introduce Kate Fox, Executive Director of Destination Salem. Kate has been the organizer, as I said earlier, of Salem Ancestry Days, or really her idea, and she's been shepherding it for quite a while now. And Kate, say a few words about the overall program and plans for now and for the future. Kate? Um, all right. Can you I hear can me? I can hear you. Yes, I can. <laughs> I got a message I've never seen before. Hello, everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land we recognize today as Salem is Namkeg or fishing place where generations of indigenous people lived and passed through for centuries. From the village upon the Namkeg River, now known as the North River, to Sakam Nanapashmet's fortification, now known as Castle Hill, the people of Namkeg farmed, fished, traded, raised families, discovered, invented, created art, and above all else, honored the lands upon which we stand today. We acknowledge that this is indigenous land and acknowledge the Massachusetts tribe who continue to honor and hold this land into the present. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first annual Salem Ancestry Days. I'm a little overwhelmed by the number of people who are joining us from all over the, the country and beyond this evening and, and really flattered that you've chosen to engage with the Salem Ancestry, Day, Salem Ancestry Days program through collaboration with organizations, including Essex Heritage, Phillips Library and Peabody Essex Museum and American Ancestors by New England Historic Genealogical Society. We have developed a weekend of programs, both virtual and in-person to celebrate ancestors, descendants and family connections in Salem and beyond. Salem Ancestry Days is a response to the scores of requests we receive from visitors who have or seek a connection to Salem's history. Once we begin dis began discussing Salem Ancestry Days as a concept, we were delighted by the amount of local interest in the sharing of and learning about family histories. 
We want Salem Ancestry Days to aid descendants in their research and making connections, but also to inspire the people who are our future ancestors, whose family stories are just beginning. Salem's rich history includes immigrant and emigrant stories from around the globe, and just as many people who have come into Salem from afar have left Salem to settle new communities and grow their families. If Salem itself were a family tree, it would have roots and branches extending off in every direction around the world. Salem Ancestry Days strives to make connections with the Namkeg and Massachusetts, the English, Irish, Italian, Polish, Russian, Jewish, African-American, Asian, and Hispanic families who have traveled through Salem and who are establishing themselves here in the 21st century. As a city that was once a center of global trade, we have global connections that continue to be a source of fascination. We are thrilled to be launching the first annual Salem Ancestry Days this weekend, and I am equally excited for what the future of this event will hold. I hope you will mark your calendars now for April 29th through May 2nd, 2022, when we expect to be fully in person with a robust schedule of lectures, panels, walking tours, and an exhibitor fair with research opportunities and more. And I truly hope that we also have hybrid events that are in person and broadcast through this wonderful technology of Zoom so that all of those who can't come to Salem are still able to benefit from the program. I wanna thank the members of the Salem Ancestry Days Planning Committee for their time and dedication to the creation of interesting educational and entertaining programming. And that includes Sherry Grishin and Ryan Connery for Essex Heritage who are behind the scenes tonight. Beth Bauer for the Salem Historical Society Dan Lipkin for the Phillips Library and Peabody Essex Museum, Elizabeth Peterson for the City of Salem's Witch House and Pioneer Village, Ginevra Morse for American Ancestors, New England Historical Genealogical Society, Kathy Gothier and Costa Siakis for the Registry of, Registry of Deeds here in Salem, Tina Jordan and Rachel Christ from the Salem Witch Museum, Karen Gahagan for Salem State University, Terry Colgren for Artemisia Botanicals, and my colleagues at Destination Salem, Stacia Cooper and Brittany DiColagero. And all credit to Stacia Cooper, who had the, was the person who walked into the office one day after a visitor called and said, I am a descendant of somebody from the Salem Witch Trials. And she hung up the phone and said, we really need a program for all of these people. And here we are today. So thank you to all of the organizations and businesses that are hosting events and programs this weekend. I inv invite all of you who are joining us um, tonight to visit SalemAncestry.org where you will find links to more than 25 events and six recordings that include live chats with genealogists, walking tours, lectures, and more. Finally, I would be remiss in my duties at Destination Salem if I did not invite you all to visit Salem.org and download the free Destination Salem app to plan a visit to Salem where our business community is following all the health guidelines and looks forward to safely welcoming visitors this summer and fall. Thanks very much to Annie Harris and Essex Heritage for hosting tonight's panel. Happy Salem Ancestry Days. I am looking forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kate, and uh, thank you for giving a preview of all the stuff that's coming up. Um, so for tonight's program, we are uh, really helpful happy to welcome representatives from three premier institutions that hold collections that are really vitally important to this region and especially to Salem's genealogical records. So as I think Kate mentioned, we have the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. We have the Southern Essex Registry of Deeds located in Salem and the American Ancestors in New England Historic Genealogical Society. So we welcome our speakers from these three wonderful institutions. As Kate said, the story of Salem in this region is one of diversity, both in demographics and also what is contained in our historical records. Uh, the region has been a place that has been continuously inhabited for millennia and continues to be a port of entry from people around the world. Some families can trace their ancestors back to generations in this place while others are first or second generation residents. What connects all of us are these roots in Salem, old and new, and the historical records, both old and new, the new ones that we're forming together. Tonight, we will look at the holdings of the three premier institutions and what they can offer to amateur and professional genealogists or just the curious researcher. 
Each presenter will share what their institution holds in the way of Salem records and how you can access them. And at the end of the presentation, you should be better equipped to begin or continue research into your Salem ancestors. So let's welcome our presenters for tonight. Ginevra Morse is Vice President of Education and Programming for American Ancestors and the New England Historical Genealogy Society. Costa Siakis is Second Assistant Register at the Southern Essex Registry of Deeds in Salem. And Dan Lipkin is the Ann C. Pingree Director of the Phillips Library at the Peabody uh, Essex Museum. And our first speaker will be Dan. So just a little bit about him. Dan oversees a talented staff charged with stewarding and sharing the library's extensive collection of books, archives, ship's journals, broadsides, and ephemera. He joined the Peabody Essex Museum in 2019 after a 16 year tenure at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts, Thomas J. Watson Library. Outside of the library, he pursues candle pin bowling, paddle boarding, record collecting, and jaywalking. So I guess he's from New York originally. So that's where the jaywalking is. So Dan, we welcome you and turn this over to you. Thanks so much, Annie. And uh, great to be with you all this evening. It's been a real pleasure to work uh, under Kate's leadership on the planning committee for this weekend. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to join you this evening to talk about what genealogical resources are available to you at, at our library and to help kick off this weekend. Um, so I am Dan Lipkin, the NC Pingree Director of the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. So PEM is the current incarnation of several institutions that have, over many years, adapted to their changing world through programmatic shifts, name changes, and mergers. And as a result, PEM is among the oldest continuously operating museums in the United States. And since the 1799 founding of the East Indian Marine Society, a library has always been a core component. The East Indian Marine Society was founded as a charitable organization member dues being used to support families that lost sailors at sea. And in addition, the members who were all masters and supercargoes of ships that sailed beyond the Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn were charged with keeping logs of their voyages to be deposited in the library and collecting items to add to a cabinet of curiosities. So here you see the 1825 hall in about 1890 and again, a couple of years ago in 2019. Today, the library is housed safely in this state-of-the-art facility, the Collection Center, located in Raleigh, Massachusetts. It's about 15 miles north of the museum. And this building is equipped with all of the appropriate climate control and security features to properly store and maintain our collections. And it's the ultimate destination for PEMS art collections, as well as the library. And you know we're becoming a place where scholars can study art objects alongside related research materials. So we in the library are very glad to be a collaborative partner in this work. And the good thing is that there's plenty of free parking. This is a view of our 19,000 square foot library stacks and the bays of shelves you see here are 12 feet tall. We hold a significant proportion of material that is unique or rare. And the combination uh, that we of primary and secondary sources that we have means that the Phillips Library is a rich and productive location for research and discovery. The scope of our library is global and nearly encyclopedic, and the library's holdings reflect the museum's collections of art in all media and across all curatorial departments, on top of our own traditional areas of strength in subjects such as Essex County history. Here's a view of our reading room, and, and you can see we are very fortunate that it has great natural light. And I'm glad to report that we've been open to researchers since mid-July by appointment, and we've been nearly fully booked since then. Uh, library staff have worked really, really hard to develop policies and procedures in order to create a safe environment for our researchers and, and our staff. And it's worth mentioning that, uh, as Annie hinted at, I'm, I'm very fortunate to lead such a talented and dedicated group in stewarding and, and sharing our collections. Phillips Library provides vital support to researchers at the museum, 
in our local and regional communities and around the globe. So anyone of any age and level of interest is welcome to visit our reading room to request and use our library materials. And as of today, we're open by appointment to a maximum of three visitors per day on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 9 to 4 p.m. Uh, to set up an appointment, you're welcome to contact us at the email you see on the screen there. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you. Hope you can make it. Our library catalog is called Philcat. And of course, an, an account is not necessary to search, but one is needed to request materials for use in our reading room. And through Philcat and through your account, you may also request scans of library materials to be delivered to you electronically. Uh, there is a small fee to help us cover the costs of staff time, but this is a way in which we can get you um, scans of things if you can't make it to us physically. The searching, of course, works like a typical library catalog, and we're more than happy to provide advice on how best to find what you're looking for. So at this point, I'll run through several categories of material that might be useful to you in your own genealogical research, and you can request and use all of these at the library. Um, you know, I'll, I'll illustrate each type with an example, but no, there's much, much more uh, to explore within each category. And finally, I'll say that my background is in art and art historical research. I'm not a genealogist myself, so uh, please forgive any omissions. And I'm sure there are resources that, um, that we have that I might not be aware of or that I do not cover here. Vital records are important, and these are early town records of births, marriages, and deaths. Uh, many were transcribed and published in the late 19th and early 20th century. Some are available online, so you may actually want to do a broader internet search for the title, as uh, those items might be out of copyright and available to you from the comfort of your own home. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was common for folks to research and self-publish genealogies of their familial line. Uh, this research was quite extensive. They called town and county land and probate records vital stats, church records, and even corresponded with relatives to gather records kept in family Bibles and anecdotal stories. And we actually have a very large collection of published genealogies for lines that populated Essex County. Many town histories, of course, were written and published for centennial, sesquicentennial or bicentennial celebrations. Prominent citizens are mentioned or their biographies included. Um, we have town histories of Essex County towns, some other towns in, in New England, and even beyond that. City directories were published in many municipalities and were the precursors to phone books, um, also now obsolete. But they do contain a listing of residents uh, by head of household often. Uh, they give street addresses, possibly a profession. They also include listings of businesses, organizations, and institutions. So we hold directories for Essex County, Massachusetts town, and some uh, cities beyond that, just like the town histories. So I consult um, the library catalog for the city and the years that we hold. Social registers were, were known as blue books, um, first published in the 1880s and historically listed members of the upper class, uh, sometimes as in this case, listing uh, only those that summered here on the North Shore. We also hold a large collection of newspapers from the 18th to the 20th century on microfilm. And you can find the various titles and the dates of our holdings for each in the catalog. Um, I, I actually had taken a number of photographs of our reels and had just kind of dumped them onto this slide. And I was gonna make, I was gonna edit it to look nicer, but frankly, this feels a bit more like our current newspaper situation because we, you know, the risk of airing a little dirty laundry, we do have many, 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 many print newspapers in deep storage that we are currently unable to get to. And this is a project that we will address in the next few years, but it will take us some time and some significant resources to figure out how to go about this work and make space for this, quite honestly, vast uh, amount of material. Cemetery transcriptions we have. These are transcriptions of gravestones and other graveyard records uh, for some local cemeteries. These can be found here. Uh, and the best way to locate these is to search Philcat uh, with the name of the cemetery. Some items are simply binders of inscriptions, hand copied. Um, and it's worth noting that, that copies of these records have been deposited by the transcribers of them in, in our library, in the Phillips Library, but also in the Salem Public Library and, and other Essex County institutions. So you may find them elsewhere. And a few interesting things, I'd like to take a brief opportunity to call out 
uh, that I discovered in the course of preparing for this talk. The first being list of polls, kind of a, an annual near census providing addresses, names, ages, and occupations of residents. Of course, there's a set of Massachusetts soldiers, sailors, and Marines in the Civil War, an eight volume set. And I stumbled across this book listing the physicians of Essex County, which is an Essex Institute publication from 1948. Um, it may have been inspired by artists and craftsmen of Essex County, Massachusetts, um, also an Essex Institute publication from 1927. And as you can see, provides details on, on furniture makers and other artists that were active in our county. Now we do of course have extensive manuscript collections that contain papers all the way back to the 17th and up to the 21st century. Um, our holdings are strongest in the 19th century and we have over a linear mile of boxes of, of papers and manuscripts and archives. Um, so for genealogical research, of course, family papers, uh, church records and diaries uh, might prove most useful. And, um, you know, we've all been teenagers, so I think we can all appreciate the sentiment that a diarist might request that a potential reader burn the diary before reading. But unfortunately for Nellie Blake, that uh, isn't in line with our current, currently accepted conservation practices. We also suggest consulting accountant books, account books. Uh, these record purchases, receipts, and other business transactions, often with names listed. We have photograph albums that can help identify people and or places. Uh, court records, both in the original manuscript and in printed transcriptions like these. Uh, if you already picked up that volume eight is shelved here between volume six and seven, feel free to give me a call. We'd love some help with reshelving material used by our visitors. Uh, shipping papers are another source of, of information. And if you have information that would lead you to believe your ancestor might be included in any of these kinds of records. Um, so this 1792 ship logbook contains a crew list at the front. And the trickiest issue facing researchers in our archives is that our manuscript collections are processed and indexed to a level where you can maybe find a general topic that might be of use to you. But you know we don't um, index every piece of paper, every correspondent, every business name, or every geographic location within an item or within a collection. We just don't, we simply don't have the time to do so. So if you know your ancestor was a tanner, for example, you might look through Cordwainer account books uh, from a similar time period to see if your ancestor sold their raw materials to shoemakers, or if you know they were a member of a particular church or social club, that would be helpful in pinpointing manuscript collections to sift through. And we're there to help as well. Now, at the risk of sounding a little overly didactic, I'll add that many of the printed materials I've just highlighted um, are in the public domain of auto copyright. So during lockdown, the library staff worked really hard over the past year to add thousands of links to freely available online versions of items that we hold in our collections. And you can use the advanced search on, our, on Philcat to explore what has been linked using the online location indicated by the, the lower arrow there. Um, also, you know, if you're searching the catalog or browsing through and you come across a link, just click on it and it'll take you there. So this, um, this example of the six links to the six volumes of the vital records, which I show a little earlier. And related to this is the recent work we've been putting into digitizing some of our collections in order to make them more broadly and freely accessible to all. One project worth mentioning is the Frank Cousins collection of glass plate negatives. And this collection is available on Digital Commonwealth, which is a statewide clearinghouse of digitized material from institutions all across our state. And beyond what we've contributed and the contributions we're currently working on, it's definitely worth your time to explore Digital Commonwealth in general. I mean, there's some really great stuff in there of all kinds, um, but I will warn you that it's really easy to lose track of time while, while doing so. And you look up and suddenly three hours are gone. So be forewarned. In any case, Cousins was a photographer working in Salem and Essex County at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, he documented Salem and surrounded, surrounding areas extensively and there are nearly 3000 images in this collection. And you may be able to find a location or an address or a scene that is related to your family history in this collection. Also some really nice pictures. 
Uh, library staff have been working really hard with the Internet Archive to put online many publications issued by the Peabody Essex Museum and our ancestor institutions. So that means a background of the American Neptune and exhibition and collection catalogs, of course, but also works on the history and culture of Salem and Essex County. And we're going to continue adding material to this page uh, that you see here and, and links to this material will be added to those related records in PhilCat. Now, one interesting story is that of the 1810 United States Census of Salem, which we have made freely available online through the Internet Archive page I've just mentioned. This was discovered uh, by one of our staff members in the stacks a couple months ago. In the end, we contacted the National Archives and Records Administration, who determined that they did not have this portion of the US Census, the, the Salem Census from 1810. Um, so it's likely a unique document and is the only source of this information. Uh, we did negotiate them with them and arrange for the rightful return of this document to the federal government. Um, but before we returned it, we digitized it. So as you can see, there are columns of information there, names, and then categories of free white males, free white females, and colored people. And at the end here, you can see the, the last passage here uh, with the signature of Ebenezer Burrell the assistant to the Registrar of Massachusetts. And this just illustrates that um, you know, much more remains to be done in and with our collections and we're discovering great things all the time. So stay tuned. So a few reminders, PhilCat is our library catalog. Again, an account isn't necessary to search, but you do need one to request materials for use in our reading room or request scans of library materials to be delivered to you electronically. Um, as I mentioned, the searching works like a typical library catalog, and we're more than happy to provide advice to you on how best to find what you're looking for. And, and the library catalog for our collection is really the, the, the real starting point uh, of your research into what we have. So I would begin there. A reminder that anyone's welcome to visit our reading room to request and use our library materials. We're open three days a week, nine to four by appointment. And finally, and one more thing, uh, we're active and engaged on Twitter and Instagram. Again, thanks to the hard work of the library staff. So that I hope that if you're on these platforms, you'll give us a follow and interact with us there. And we do try to have a little bit of fun. So, so join us there. Um, feel free to get in touch. We're happy to answer questions, provide advice on finding what you need or arrange an appointment. And our research email is the best contact to begin with. So feel free to check out our webpage on the PEM website for more information. And thanks for your attention. And uh, I hope to see you in a rally. Well, thank you, Dan. Thanks so much. A lot of, a lot of information there. Um, our next speaker is Siakis, uh, Costa Siakis, sorry, who is the second assistant register at the Southern Essex Registry of Deeds located in Salem. And he has worked at the registry for 20 years, started as an intern in high school and college, uh, assisting the GIS department uh, with the Stark projects before starting full-time in the IT department. And during that time, Acosta has worked on uh, and then later overseen the digitization of the registry's uh, most historic documents, uh, continuing register John O'Brien's push to make all of the records available for free on the website. So this is a great resource. Uh, Costa, you are up next. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, so like I said, uh, all of our records are available online. Um, it's, a, it's a great resource for you guys um, to make use of. Um, we prepared a little video that kind of will go through all of the resources that we have on site here and what's available online and how to access them. Um, so I'm going to just share that now. Hello and welcome to the Southern Essex District Registry of Deeds. Thank you for joining us here at the Registry for Salem Ancestry Days. By visiting us, you have begun your journey to learning about your Salem ancestors, where they lived, worked, and hopefully played. Here at the Registry, we are the keepers of land records for the 30 cities and towns. From as far north as Haverhill, Merrimack, Amesbury, and Salisbury, to the south from Lynn, Saugust, and Linfield, to the east, Gloucester, Marblehead, Salem, Swampscott, and Lynn, to the west, Boxford, Topsfield, Middleton, and all the cities and towns in between. Here you will notice 
we have a wall dedicated to how the deeds tell the story. This wall is a collage of photos and property documents of a few of the significant properties within our district. The documents are a curated collection showing a brief history of how the properties as we know them today became such. Of note on the wall is the Turner Ingersoll House, otherwise known as the House of Seven Gables. So before we begin our tutorial of how to research your ancestors' property, let's take a quick tour of the registry and actually see some of the documents available for your use. The first area we will visit is the public area. This area is used to research properties as well as make copies of plans and documents pertaining to properties. As is with most public buildings, COVID restrictions do apply, so we request that you contact customer service to find out exactly what these restrictions are. The next area we'll be visiting is the document books. Prior to COVID, the books were available for viewing during our regular hours. Currently, all materials are unavailable for viewing or use unless requested in advance of your appointment. All of our documents, such as the books, plans, indexes, etc., are available online from 1640 to present. Now that we've viewed the book area, let's move on to plan storage, the actual drawn plans for properties, as well as the historic assessors maps are stored in this area. Plans are frequently used in conjunction with deeds to locate parcels that are difficult to identify. Leaving plan storage, our next stop will be the engineering plan room. Though most likely not helpful in your ancestry land search, engineering plans show railroad, county, and state layouts such as roads and highways. Let me take a moment to give you a broad idea of what resources the Registry of Deeds has to offer for researching properties. As I mentioned previously, the Southern Essex District Registry of Deeds maintains land records for 30 cities and towns within our district. For a complete list of the cities and towns in our district, please visit our website at www.salemdeeds.com. The Registry is further charged with recording, maintaining, preserving and providing public access to our land records for the communities located within our jurisdiction. The Southern Essex Registry of Deeds is the proud custodian of the longest continuous county land records in the nation, 1640 to the present. At this point, I would like to tell you about the records available to the public for research that are housed here at the registry with a brief explanation of what they consist of. County Land Records 1640 to present. These are all types of land records including deeds, mortgages, plans of land, to name only a few. Please note that not all properties have plans as they are not required as part of land ownership documents. Also, the registry does not record what are commonly known as plot plans, plans that show the placement of buildings upon the property. The next collection are our Norfolk deeds. Prior to the district as it is known today, Old Norfolk County included Salisbury, Hampton, Haverhill, Exeter, Dover, and Strawberry Bank. In 1680, the General Court dissolved the county as established in 1643, when New Hampshire separated from Massachusetts. Only Salisbury and Haverhill are still included in our current district. The name Norfolk is actually a derivative of North Folk. The new county of New Norfolk County was established in 1793 and is the predecessor to our current county. Also available in our collection are the Ipswich Deed Books. The Registry of Deeds was originally part of the early court system and documents were recorded when the court was in session. Along with the courts in Salem, court was also held in Ipswich. A second set of books was kept in Ipswich from 1640 to 1695. These are what are known as the Ipswich books. Another set of books housed here at the registry are the Book of Executions and Depositions. This set of records referenced in the registry indices contain depositions and statements regarding land ownership. They are separate and different than deeds. We also have atlases. Our current collection of atlases consists of cities and towns within our district showing the cities or towns at street level throughout various time periods. Some atlases will show buildings sited on the land, some will have owners' names listed on the property, as well as showing waterways, farms, pastures, railroads, parks, 
and assorted other areas. The atlases also include a historic county map of Essex County. Also included in our atlas collection are the Harbor and Land Commission plans and Massachusetts and World Atlases. Next in our resource collection are the historic assessors maps. This is a donated collection from communities of historic assessors maps. These maps are frequently used in conjunction with deeds to locate parcels that are difficult to identify. A rather unique component to our collection which can be very helpful in research are the city directories. These books are commonly known as the Polk directories. They were and are still created for each individual community and published yearly. These directories provide information such as pertinent city or town government information, alphabetical business listings, street and house directory, giving the name of all parties as well as businesses connected to the address, and an alphabetical listing of residents. The final component to our resource collection is the early probate records, 1638 to 1881. These are on microfilm. These records can be invaluable in property searches as they often help to determine ownership of property that was inherited instead of owned by deed. These documents are also accessible online at www.americanancestors.org. Now that I've given you a glimpse of what is available for research at the registry, here is our COVID caveat. Physical records are currently unavailable due to the pandemic without a pre-scheduled research appointment. But online access is available for land records, 1640 to present, assesses maps, and atlases. Offline access, which means setting up an appointment, coming in to view the actual books and documents, are available for Norfolk books, Ipswich books, Book of Execution and Depositions, City Directories, and Early Probate Records. The research resources available at the Southern Essex District Registry of Deeds are numerous. These resources should be helpful in locating land records for your ancestors who settled here in Salem. Think of the Salem Registry of Deeds as the Ancestry.com of land records for not only Salem, but for the 30 communities we serve. To begin researching your ancestors' land records, you will need to compile some pertinent information. To successfully search our resources, you should have at least one, if not all, of the following. First, your ancestor's full name with correct spelling if possible. Second, a location or address of the property they are thought to have owned or resided at. And third, the time period for which they were thought to have owned or resided at such property. Once this information is compiled, you will be able to initiate your search. For instructions on how to search using our website, please contact our Customer Service Department at 978-542-1704 or 1705, or email us at Southern Essex Customer Service at S-E-C dot state.ma.us. Our staff will be more than happy to get you started on your way to locating the documents necessary to tell you where your ancestors live, worked, and played. On behalf of Register John L. O'Brien and the Registry staff, we thank you for your interest in our resources and the history and stories these resources will provide. Be safe and enjoy Salem Ancestry Days. Do you have anything, uh, uh, Costa or Kathy, that you want to add to that? As it was... uh, so those few records that we did mention aren't available online yet. We are working to get those online. Um, they're digitized, so if you know specifically what you're looking for, we can always send you uh, copies of them, email them to you, or print if you prefer that. Um, I think that's mostly it, right?
pretty much covers everything. Yeah. Thank you again for inviting us to be part of this and um, good luck to on your searches. I'm sure we'll have some more questions in a minute. So, so hang on with us. Yep. Uh, but I just have one quick question. This is all free. All these services are, are free. Yeah, everything is free. Um, and especially for um, your own property or your family's history, we provide that copies of that stuff for free. Um, the register provides those uh, free of charge. Great. Okay. Well, certainly stay for the questions and the answers. But now for our third speaker, uh, Ginevra Morse uh, joined the American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society as a staff in a uh, member in uh, 2010. She joined as the publications coordinator uh, and she transitioned to the education team as online education coordinator in 2013. And in this role, Ginevra developed the American Ancestors Online Learning Center, which is an on online portal to resources, including webinars, online courses and subject guides and more to help you do research. In 2014, Ginevra became the Director of Education and Online Programs, and today she oversees all programming for the organization, including research tours and programs, seminars, workshops, online programs, conferences, group visits, off-site lectures, youth education, and community events. Ginevra previously worked in marketing for an academic foreign language publisher, where she created webinars and other online learning initiatives for teachers. She holds a BA in anthropology from McGill University in Montreal, and she enjoys researching her own family connections to Essex County and is a current resident of, Sa of Salem. So Ginevra, please start. Well, thank you, Annie, and it's uh, it's great to be here with all of you. And so I too have a video just highlighting some of the resources that American Ancestor has for Salem, Massachusetts. And I will say that this is just an, an outline or kind of a, a brief look at some of the resources that we have and really just the tip of the iceberg for um, all of our holdings. So I'm going to play the video and let's hope it works. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is the oldest and largest nonprofit genealogical society in America. Since 1845, we have assisted individuals and families throughout New England, across the country, and around the world uncover their family stories. Today, we operate an eight-story research center on Newbury Street in Boston that contains thousands of volumes, rare books, and millions of one-of-a-kind manuscript items. We host an award-winning website featuring more than 475 databases with 1.4 billion searchable names. Each year, we offer more than 200 educational programs that span genealogical, historical, and cultural topics. We publish how-to guides, record compilations, scholarly journals and periodicals, and private family histories. And we employ a team of genealogists, historians, archivists, and authors who are available to help you discover your family history, but also preserve it for generations to come. And our research center is also the anchor location to the PBS series, Finding Your Roots, with our trustee emeritus, Henry Louis Gates, Jr. And our experts provide research assistance for the on-air reveals. Our records, resources, and expertise span the globe with databases and collections covering all 50 US states and 23 countries. But since our founding, one of our core areas of interest has been New England research, with particular interest in Essex County, Massachusetts. In honor of Salem Ancestry Days, I will highlight just some of the collections and resources available to you in researching your family's connection to Salem. Most of the collections, records, and services that I'll be discussing are available to you from home through our website, AmericanAncestors.org. But there are even more resources when you come in person to our research center in Boston. And we will be reopening on an appointment-only basis in June of this year. American Ancestors is a nonprofit member-based organization 
meaning to access all of our collections, you do need to be a current member. However, you can create a free guest account to access our library of educational videos, subject guides, and 35 of our databases, most of which pertain to Massachusetts. Some of you at home may be hoping to connect your roots to Salem's colonial past. The colonizers who arrived on the shores of Massachusetts in the 17th century are probably some of the most researched and written about people on the planet. That means that the research may already have been done for you, and you just need to know where to look. If you have English ancestors living in Salem, or really anywhere in New England prior to 1640, I highly recommend that you start by checking out our Great Migration Study Project, led by Robert Charles Anderson. Started in 1995, this study project aims to provide a genealogical and biographical sketch for nearly 20,000 individuals who arrived in New England between 1620, with the arrival of the Mayflower, and 1640, just before the outbreak of the English Civil War. The study project is comprised of 17 volumes, a newsletter, tours, interactive map, and searchable databases. To show you what type of information may be included in a sketch, let's do a search for Roger Conant. On AmericanAncestors.org, I go to Search, Advanced Search, and I will enter the first name and last name, Roger Conant, and then Salem, Massachusetts as a location. If I hit search, I get 168 results. I can narrow that down just to mentions of Roger Conant in the Great Migration Study Project by using the filter on the left-hand side. On this results page, I see a brief outline of some of the main information, and in this entry, he's listed as the featured name. I'll click on this name to get a bit more information, and then I can click View Image to see the source material. So here is the sketch. It includes information about his origins, immigration to New England, occupation, church membership, the many positions he held, his estate, his birth, marriage, and death information, and then a list of his 10 children with some basic information on each. There's also commentary on the research and what information is still yet to be discovered. And this sketch of Roger Conant is nine pages long, and you can print or download the full article from here. This is just one example of the type of colonial resources we have on our site, including New England marriages prior to 1700, early New England families, which is another study project, and so many more. Now, some of you may also be curious about a possible connection to the Mayflower that arrived in Plymouth in 1620. While Salem is only 80 miles north of Plymouth, the two early settlements actually had very little interaction. There were at least four Mayflower families with an immediate connection to Salem. Richard Moore was a Mayflower passenger and resident of Salem as early as 1637. He died in Salem in the 1690s. Remember Allerton was a Mayflower passenger and member of the Salem Church in 1637 with her husband Moses Maverick. Remember's father, Isaac Allerton, who was also a Mayflower passenger, joined the Salem Church in 1647. Elizabeth Turner, daughter of Mayflower passenger John Turner, was living in Salem by 1651. And Benjamin Vermays, later the son-in-law of Mayflower passenger William Bradford, joined the Salem Church in 1642. You can explore these stories and databases, view a timeline of key events that led up to and followed the Mayflower Landing, learn about the Wampanoag people who inhabited Plymouth prior to colonization by the English, and more by going to mayflower.americanancestors.org. Today, there are an estimated 35 million people worldwide descended from the Mayflower passengers. U.S. Congressman Seth Moulton, for example, is a descendant of Stephen Hopkins. Turning now to another important resource available on our website that spans the colonial period through the late 19th century is our searchable database of Essex County probate files. Whereas you may find only an index on other websites, American ancestors worked with the Massachusetts Supreme Court Judicial Archives to digitize and index more than 58,000 Essex County probate cases filed between 1638 and 1881. This makes up more than 950,000 pages of wills, 
guardianships, administrations, and various other types of probate records. This database is available for free for guest users of American Ancestors. As an example, I searched for the probate of John Ramon, a prominent black business owner and entrepreneur in Salem during the 19th century. His children would go on to become business owners, social activists, and leaders in the abolitionist movement. In this database, we find the last will and testament of John Ramon from 1874. It details the distribution of his estate and property to his children, grandchildren, friends, and even a sum of $100 to the Association of Aged and Destitute Women in Salem. And here is his signature. Guardianships are another important type of probate document that details what happens to minor children after the death of a parent. Here is an example from our Essex County Probate Database that involves the guardianship of author Nathaniel Hawthorne and his two sisters after the death of their father, a sea captain. Here we see little Nathaniel at just 11 years old, and his mother, Elizabeth, was granted guardianship. In 2017, American Ancestors announced a partnership with the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston to create an online searchable database of millions of sacramental records between 1789 to 1920 from over 100 parishes across the greater Boston area, including Salem. We have digitized and indexed baptisms, marriages, deaths, and confirmations for Immaculate Conception, St. James, and St. Joseph's Church. There are two ways to access these records, an image-only version by which you can browse by parish, and this database is free to guest users, and then there's a searchable collection by which you can search by name, date, location, record type, volume, and by other names that might appear on the record. So here I've done a search for the last name Desjardins with the location of Salem. This is an original 1903 marriage record for Charles LeBlanc and Clara Roy Desjardins. You'll see it gives the name of the bride and groom, the names of their fathers, date, location, and witness names. If you have trouble reading the handwriting, you can also click on the transcript tag to see how we have indexed the main search terms. You will also find several different languages in these records, such as French, Italian, Spanish, Polish, Portuguese, and others. This usually appears in the notes field, and if we scroll down on this page, we see another marriage with a note in French that states that the bride was here visiting a friend and after three months decided to marry this Isaac Davis Baker of Boston. So you really never know what you might find by looking at the original record. American Ancestors is also home to the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, a destination for exploring and preserving the histories of Jewish families and institutions in New England. It is the only historical center dedicated to and specializing in New England Jewish history. Within our archives are the papers of Jewish families and individuals, as well as the records of synagogues and other organizations from Lynn, Peabody, Beverly, Marblehead, Swampscott, Newburyport, Manchester, and Salem, including a recorded oral history project living on the North Shore of Massachusetts before 1950. Donated by the Jewish Heritage Center of the North Shore, this collection includes photographs, pamphlets, papers, and other materials of Salem's Temple Shalom of the Congregation Sons of Jacob. To access these papers and many other archival collections, you will turn to our digital library and archives at digital.americanancestors.org. The resources found here are different from our index databases found on AmericanAncestors.org. Instead of name-rich record compilations, these manuscript materials are unique resources that are created by individuals and tell of everyday life. They may be diaries, letters, account books, photographs, Bible records, or unpublished genealogies. Instead of searching by an individual's name, you may try searching by a place or subject. Manuscripts can take quite a lot of time and patience, but you will get a better sense of the time and place your ancestor lived. 
Here is the home page of our Digital Library and Archives. You can search by repository, so either the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, the R. Stanton Avery Special Collections, or our Research Library. Or you can also search by subject, such as the Revolutionary War. Here is an example of a manuscript that you might find. These are five handwritten letters composed by Nathaniel Noyes to William Henshaw between 1774 and 1775, discussing events occurring in Boston, Salem, and elsewhere in the months preceding the outbreak of war. But it's important to remember that not everything is available online, not everything has been digitized, and in the grand scheme of things, very little has actually been indexed and is searchable you might turn to the catalogs of historical societies, libraries, and museums to see what they hold in person. Our library catalog at library.nehgs.org will bring you to rare books, local histories, and other manuscript items not found online. Family history research is more than filling out your family tree. It's an opportunity to understand history and connect with people and places in the present in new and meaningful ways. In your research, you'll encounter different types of records, unfamiliar languages, and new subjects. It is a field of constant learning. For that reason, our educational resources, our subject guides, our video library, and educational programs offer you the tools and techniques to make real headway in your research. From 17th century New England research, to African American genealogy, to using newspapers in your family history, to interpreting your DNA results, and to all subjects in between, we have something for everyone. You can find many of our resources under the Learn menu on our homepage, and to register for our upcoming programs, check under our Events menu. Perhaps our greatest resource at American Ancestors, however, are our experts. They compile our resources, instruct our programs, and assist you with your family history research. If you aren't sure where to turn next in your research, are having trouble reading a certain part of a record, have a reference question, or just aren't sure where to begin, our experts can help. Our chat service from Mondays to Saturdays, 9 to 5 Eastern Time, puts you in direct contact with a genealogist, and it's free and open to the public. Researching your family history is one of the most important journeys you'll undertake in your lifetime. Whether you are just starting out or you have been researching for decades, American Ancestors is here to help you at any step in the process. Best of luck in your research. Never do you want to add anything to that? That was a wonderful presentation. Thanks. Um, I'm glad it worked. <laughs> um, just that, you know, just to reiterate that that was just kind of a, a snapshot of some of the materials that we have. And, um, you know, you just have to kind of dig deeper into your own family history, look at what resources are available on our site on, at each of the repositories that we've talked about tonight. Um, and uh, it's just kind of a, an ongoing uh, journey and uh, route for discovery. So best of luck to everyone. Well, amazing, amazing resources, amazing resources for, for all of you. Um, so I think we'll now do the questions. Um, and I, I'm not sure I really wanna call on you. I think we'll try to keep it kind of open. So um, each of you can, can speak up. Um, I have one uh, quick question that just came, which was, um, uh, let me just pull it up again. Um, is there a record of everyone who came on the Arabella? I don't know who would want to try to answer that. Maybe start with Dan, would you want to take a shot at that? Well, um, this is the Arabella that came to Salem in the 16th. 30, 30, I think something like that. Um, I'm not offhand. I don't know. Um, so I don't mean to put you on the spot. Maybe yeah. <laughs> never. <laughs> All of your early well, migration probably has that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say the Great Migration Study Project. Um, so those volumes, like I said in the in the video, those uh, seek to document about twenty thousand people who 
English settlers who come to New England between 1620 and 1640. Um, in the index and in the, in the uh, the main body of that study project is searchable on our website, but um, you can also in the index, there is uh, an index of ship names. Um, so you can also kind of search by that way. It's not maybe a separate volume just for passengers of the Arbella, but um, you know, it is information that is pieced together within the Great Migration Directory. Um, you know, passenger lists, I'll just say in the 17th century are, um, what exists have been compiled and published. Um, so there are a few different resources that you could look at. Um, but generally speaking, you know, passenger lists in the 17th century f going, say, from England to New England, it's, they're different than what you would see in, say, the 19th century. Um, you know, it, there wasn't any kind of... Um, you know, strict law or guidance that every ship needed to have a manifest or a passenger list. So um, a lot of the documents that are compiled are actually from um, UK sources. Um, so a few a few options there. Uh, but if someone else knows of of uh, a full list of the Arabella uh, passengers, they can put it in the chat too. <laughs> oh, Good point. And there is uh, some information being put in the chat. Um, and I think um, I'm seeing there's a, a, a website that's mentioned about more ancestry programs. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, actually a lot of other archives uh, and historical record repositories in this region. And I'm hoping, I don't, we don't have a list in the, in the chat room, but I think that we can make a list available in other places. But, uh, you know, one of the things I heard uh, each of you kind of mention are, are um, both the, the great work that you've done, but also the upcoming uh, challenges. And I was curious whether each of you would address uh, what your priorities are for, say, digitization. That seems to obviously be the big, big, big push. And um, wondering what you know, what's your top priorities? I see Dan, you know, nodding his head. So maybe I'll, I'll call on you first. Um, because I know you have lots of stuff to digitize. We have a lot of stuff to digitize. We have very large backlogs and, and a lot to digitize. So I think we're, you know, we're starting with, because we are so strong in, in maritime history and, and PEM is, is, such, is known as um, in part a maritime museum, we've been working on some of our logbooks, um, documenting commercial activity and voyages, um, primarily in the, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, we are going to be turning to manuscript collections pretty soon. And, you know, we're interested in local history. We're interested in uh, Black history of Essex County. We're interested in, um, in, um, in ephemera and in um, all kinds of different information. We're working on the photographs of Samuel Chamberlain right now. We have a huge collection of his negatives, and that's going to be our next project that goes up on, on Digital Commonwealth. So another repository, you know, another collection of images of local uh, local scenes. And Chamberlain was working from the like the mid 1950s through the mid 19. I think he died in 1975. So we've got you know another 50 years after Frank Cousins. So it will be interesting to 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 see the that kind of the changes that happened in the intervening years. Um, the list is endless, Annie. I know. Well, that's what well, we want to digitize. A challenge. <laughs> and you know, I mean, it's really amazing to hear about what um, Ginevra and her colleagues have been able to do, and what what Costa and, and his folks at the Deeds Office have been. You know, it's millions and millions of pages. I mean, 1.4 billion names to be searched. I mean, that's just it's mind boggling, right? It, it is. <laughs> So uh, let me ask uh, Costa, what, what are the next challenges or priorities for the, uh, your group? So uh, like I said, most, almost all of our records are digitized already, including the few that aren't available on our website yet. Um, so where the challenges that we're facing right now are indexing those things and how to make a more friendly index, but also looking at some of the indices that we've built over the years and the just this searchability of them and trying to make them more user-friendly, um, as well as uh, expanding what you can search. So right now, the only information you can search for is the names that are indexed. The land records in Massachusetts are name-based. So 
um, you have to know a name to start with. Um, but we're trying, we're working on making uh, the documents entirely searchable, kind of like an OCR system that'll search the entire document for any phrase that you put in, um, including streets and that kind of thing. Um, because not every document has a street index, but generally there'll be something, you know, some information like that. So we're working, those are our next uh, big projects. Uh, those will be part of our update to the website that's coming up in the future, um, hopefully with some new technology and a little bit of a more modern interface. Um, but yeah, so that those are our kind of um, next tasks are just getting the getting the information indexed and available online uh, in a in a more user friendly manner. Good, good to hear. So I'm going to ask this question once once more to Ginevra, and then I do have some specific questions I'll ask. But Ginevra, I mean, you guys have an incredible amount of stuff uh, digitized. What are, what are your sort of top top priorities next? Yeah, uh, so we're um, we have a lot of projects that are ongoing, um, and I will say that all of the uh, a lot of the digitization, the scanning of the original materials or the published materials, and the indexing is done by volunteers. So mm -hmm. we have volunteers um, who come into the building to help scan um, the resources, but then we have volunteers really around the world who are indexing these materials from home. So certainly if, uh, if you find yourself with some time on your hands or you want to kind of learn a record set even more deeply, then um, you can certainly become a volunteer and uh, help us index some of those records. So um, the Catholic Records Project, for example, with the Archdiocese of Boston, um, we've completed uh, up until 1900, but um, recently we've expanded that project up until uh, through the year 1920. So um, we're kind of working on indexing those. We have, um, we're also expanding that collaboration with the Archdiocese of Boston um, to the Massachusetts Association of Cemetery Records, the Catholic Association of, of uh, Cemeteries. So that is, um, you know, that's an ongoing project. Uh, oftentimes we'll re-index materials that, or uh, databases that um, maybe you know, we've expanded the search terms. And so then we want to go back and kind of update that index. So we're working on updating all of the vital records that are in the uh, New England Historical and Genealogical Register, which is the uh, longest running genealogical journal in the country. It was uh, started in 1847. Um, so there are a lot of different projects. And um, I will say that I can put this in the chat. Um, we have a website called uh, dbnews.americanancestors.org and you can sign up to get um, alerts anytime new databases are announced. Um, and like I said, we're, we're always coming out with new materials, uh, new digitization projects. Um, and certainly in the last year, the push has been putting more on that digital library and archives. So those manuscript materials, um, and then also just increasing the number of virtual programs that we offer. So um, certainly digitizing records, but also helping people interpret um, those materials as well. Yes, yes. Well, ambitious schedule. <laughs> I didn't know you did so much with volunteers. Wow. Maybe we'll get some people to sign up. Um, I am seeing some questions about uh, suggestions about finding out uh, about um, women and children, um, usually part of family, not necessarily listed on city directories or in other ways. Uh, can some of you suggest uh, sort of how you go about looking for the um, people that are other than the prominent white male on some of these lists? What are some of the best techniques? I can say a few words about that. It might depend on the time period that you're looking at, but um, oftentimes in order to find the women, you have to focus on the men. Um, you have to look at, you know, uh, fathers, brothers, you know, male cousins, um, husbands, first husbands, second husbands. Um, and uh, sometimes kind of um, you're, you might not find a record directly about that individual woman, um, but you may be able to find inferences uh, by looking at the men in their lives. Um, so that's, that's one technique or one tip. Um, we've done uh, education programs on tracing female ancestors and um, you know, especially finding maiden names can be especially difficult, uh, finding parents. 
Um, so we do have some resources on our website. And then we've also, just in the last couple of years, our magazine, American Ancestors uh, magazine, our, we had a cover story on um, tracing female ancestry as well. So um, that's certainly, you're definitely not alone in um, you know, having some trouble finding your, your female ancestors because you know, um, women are often overlooked and not included in a lot of these records that we've been talking about. Well, I'd be curious also, uh, they're obviously, uh, you know, uh, African Americans and indigenous people and really anybody of color was also extremely uh, difficult to find. I don't know if you have comments or whether Costa or Dan want to say anything, but uh, that's pretty, ch pretty challenging. Well, I mean, I think that ties back to our, our, our priorities. And, you know, we know that I mean, remember Ginevra said in her video that some of these, uh, the Mayflower descendants, you know, that's some of the most, <laughs> that that research is, has been done and done and done and it's it's out there. And so I think um, those of us that have um, really broad collections and deep collections, we can do a little bit of work to try to, try to bring African Americans and Black folks and women to the to the surface, and we can identify those pieces of our collection that may um, have something to do with those populations. So that's you know that's one of the things that we can do to try to provide a little bit of counterweight to all the existing research that's out there on on um, white settlers and colonizers. And I just I got a, a question here. How would you find out if an ancestor owned slaves? Um, that you might find from the probate records and stuff, right? Um, I don't know if Costa wants to say anything about that, but that's my understanding. It's, I think it's harder to find out if your ancestor had been a slave, maybe, than if they owned them. But um, is that yep, a, uh, probate records, um, census records? They were property, they were left people in their will. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so probate, uh, census records, um, you know, we also have a subject guide on African American research um, that talks about, um, you know, some of the some of the difficulties and some of the ways to um, research African American ancestry. Um, but as far as looking into uh, the owners of enslaved people, uh, definitely probate records would be um, kind of a first step, I would think, yeah. And I think I want to ask Costa, uh, I believe you you all did a lot of work with uh, uh, Indian uh, land holdings and maps and stuff. And how accessible is that? And um, can you tell me a little bit, of, tell us a little bit about that? And then I have a question here about uh, how can land grants in Essex County uh, be researched? Sure. So um, we did we did do a project a little while back called uh, the Native American Deeds, where we uh, using Sidney Perley's um, book. It was uh, I believe it's called the Indian Deeds of Essex, excuse me, of Essex County. Um, we we pulled out those Native American deeds that were that the colonists used to um, legally, in quotes, um, transfer the land from the indigenous peoples to themselves. And actually that kind of ties into the grants issue where they were afraid that the king was going to rescind the grant. And so they started procuring these deeds from the native people to prove that they owned it legally. Um, so we did pull those out and we do a project called uh, Native American Deeds where you can see those. Um, it needs a little bit of updating, um, but those are in our records. Um, some of them are in the Norfolk and Ipswich books. So um, they're not available online yet, but um, we can send you copies and stuff like that. Um, the thing to keep in keep in mind with our records are their transcriptions of the original documents. So someone brings a document to the registry or in the old days, the courts, and the clerk or uh, recorder would transcribe that into our book of records. So even though they are the original and legal copies of those documents, they're not the original signatures. So on those Native American deeds, you have you know the symbols that the natives would have signed with, but they're you know, transcribed by a recorder or a clerk. Um, but those records are here um, and available. We don't have any information on the um, actual grants themselves though. That's not part of our, um, part of our record. Um, so you'd have to go to other sources for that. Uh, do you know what other sources there might be or is anybody, the other two um, know? Not really sure, okay. unfortunately, sorry. Okay. 
Um, and let's see, I have a few others. Uh, now I have some, um, let's see. Um, how do you find out about, an, how do you find out how an, how an ancestor died if it's not listed in the vital records? Anybody know? I don't know. That will also depend on the time period that you're talking about and what's available. Um, if, you know, if you're talking more recently and on death certificates, there's usually a cause of death. Um, you may find, um, you know, I, I wouldn't put past uh, searching, I, I mentioned manuscript items and diaries and letters and correspondence. Um, like I said, those usually aren't uh, indexed. So it's, you're searching more by subject or maybe sometimes by a surname, sometimes by a place, um, but you'll be, kind of amazed looking at old diaries and um, for a certain community that there are tons of busybodies in communities and they may be talking about, oh, so-and-so died of this or, um, you know, there's an outbreak of that. So I, I really think, you know, even if the diary is not for your ancestor, if they're, if it's a diary of someone living in the same community as your ancestor around the same time period, take a look and you'll learn so much about what your ancestor's life was like. So you're saying that, I mean, I'm familiar with uh, Reverend Bentley in uh, Salem, who was an incredible busybody and wrote about everything. And you're saying that he was not the exception. There are lots of- He was not the like exception. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Dan, do you have those? Do you have some of those diaries? That, that... Yeah, yeah, we do. And I'll also throw out that newspapers might be another source oh. for that kind of information. You know, and obituaries, basically, right? Are those uh, are the diaries and the newspapers reasonably searchable now, or not? That uh, I I think it depends. Um, you know, some more and more newspapers are be, are being digitized now. Um, so you'll find more and more of those out there. Um, the Library of Congress has a Chronicling America project, which does not have anything from Massachusetts, which is really interesting. But um, I've just heard that I think Boston Public Library is going to be the, the, the hub for newspapers um, on Chronicling America. So we'll see how that develops. And more and more newspapers will be going into Digital Commonwealth. I'm, I, I'm aware of that. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, newspapers, of course, that's a, that's a great suggestion and that there are so many different uh, websites out there that are digitizing, um, you know, with a lot of, a lot of these record sets, there's no one stop shop, you have to search multiple websites, you have to kind of research before you even get to the research. Right. Um, so there's, you know, newspapers, um, archive, there's, I mean, even Google, um, has uh, lots of digitized papers. So um, just, I think, yeah, uh, you just have to kind of search and see what you can find. Yeah. Okay. Now I have a, a different question is from somebody, is there a recommended way to check the historical significance of primary source documents? I have several that go back to the 17th century. Um, so that's a different kind of question. If you have, if you have documents, how do you figure out what their value is. And I don't know if it's just monetary value or, or historical value. Well, I think we probably do the same types of things when we're considering acquiring something. You know, it's a combination of what the content of the document is, what names are included in their time period, location, um, what connections there might be to other people, historical figures. Um, you know, hard to know without more specific information. I mean, you know, you can look at auction records, um, for example, um, that sort of thing, but it's hard to kind of make a blanket statement about how you might um, determine what, how historically significant some some piece of paper. Yes, do, do people like your library or the Genealogical Society, do they ever, do people take documents in there and have people look at them? Um, or is that unrealistic? Is it really more something we, to go to we, actually, we actually are not allowed to, okay. um, uh, to um, appraise documents. Okay. Um, we can provide advice on how you might find information about 
the document you have, or we can refer you to appraisers that could help you determine a value of something. But it's a conflict of for the for the museum world. It's a conflict of interest. Um, and maybe they were really asking about whether they're just significant, whether they were significant. Um, yeah. Let's see, I have an, another question here about, I think we're gonna start to, to wind this up probably, but are there voting records digitized that are searchable by name? Uh, I don't know, Does, um, who has the voting records? Was that, uh, Costa, did you have some voting records there? Annie, it's Kathy. Um, I would suggest that probably the city has those records and I'm not sure if they've digitized or not. City clerk's office most likely or town clerk. I'm assuming they're looking for old ones. And I guess Dan, you yeah. said you had some maybe at the at the um yes, the maybe. Clerk. Yeah, we we actually have um I'll air more dirty laundry here. We have <laughs> we have a very large collection of Salem town records that are unprocessed and we're trying to work out the ownership of that with the city right now so we can figure out what to do with it but um, okay might be in there too <laughs> yeah and um, again depends on time period and um, but uh, ancestry also has um, you might find voter registrations you're not you probably won't find you know who they voted for but as far as you know voter registrations you can you can typically find those um, some have been digitized you can check ancestry.com or um, as Dan said town records as well and then we have a few specific questions uh, you know about I'm an ancestor of somebody or I'm looking for somebody um, would they be able to these people be able to uh, write to your organizations directly and ask i think you said they could and there were you gave uh web addresses and things um so if they wrote a general question saying i'm a relation of some i'm a descendant of so and so can i do you have any information um they could just write to your general uh email and um so you, you'll respond on some of yes these? happy to help okay I think that would take care of most of these other things I'm seeing. Can I answer I, one? Oh, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, and um, I mentioned it in the video, and I just put it in the chat panel as well, but you can chat with our genealogists um, Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5. And so if you're looking for you know, all these questions that maybe we couldn't answer fully, you can definitely talk to them, um, and that's free, open to the public. That's, that's wonderful. You guys are great. This is, this is terrific. Um, any final last uh, comments? Annie, I just wanted to answer Karen's question here about spoilation claims. Um, those are claims presented by United States citizens against countries for vessels and cargo taken by privateers. And I think, I think I've only seen them associated with the, the quasi war between the US and France, um, which is the last couple of years of the 1700s. But there might be some 1812 um, claims as well. The Bark Lucy that you mentioned, I, you'd need to figure out more about what the years of, of when that that uh, that ship was on the sea and when it was um, attacked. So it might be 1812, it might be quasi-war. Okay. Uh, any other last words, uh, Geneva? No, just, you know, best of luck in your research. Um, family history can be a lot of fun. And um, I hope everyone has success and that we were able to provide some details and next steps for you. All right, I love your enthusiasm, all your enthusiasm for, for this research and doing this. Uh, Costa and Kathy, do you have any last words? Uh, nope, just the same as everyone else. Best of luck. And um, we are uh, we do encourage people to make appointments if they need to come in for research, but starting Monday, we are going to allow people to come in. And if we have space, you can, you know, by walk in, you'll be able, you'll be able to come in. Um, and yeah, but like we, like you said, contact us by phone or email. We'll be happy to help you as best as we can. Um, we can't give legal advice, but we can steer you in the direction of how to find the stuff you're looking for that we have. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having us. Well, thank you so much for all three of you giving up your uh, Friday night to appear. Uh, I think we, you know, we've been on Zoom for almost an hour and a half, and that's pretty much a maximum. I think hour is about, about <laughs> a long time for Zoom. So I think we'll wind this up, but uh, 
uh, there's the websites. We're going to be sending this out again. Um, so everybody registered. We have your email. We will be sending out this in, entire uh, recording. Um, I assume you'll be able to. Uh, we'll send you out the link, and you'll be able to get that probably next week. Uh, you have these email addresses. Uh, send your questions in and do this research. It sounds really great. Really, really interesting. Well, thank you. Good night. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay.